Let's just sit in it for the first few minutes, shall we? I like how it's we. Yeah, we're going to sit We. No, as in we are. We are the champions. I am also a champion. Being yep. an Italian. You technically were for the morning. Yeah, I was there. I was enjoying it. Me and Bakula. Ready? Were... It's a really nice instrumental. Almost seems copyright free. Mm. It's one of those. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah, just you are right. Almost seems, but I don't think it is. Do, 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 do. We are the champions. We are the champions. No Can we specify who we are? The losers. That's England. We England are the losers. The In the mud. Champions. Siamo Cup Champion Italia. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> that's that, that's our little intro today. We're, we've already got some engagement in the Twitch. Uh, Tom8678, congrats, Nick. No, thank you very much. Thanks, Tom. Uh, Pakua as well, Forza Italia. Pakua, I hope your voice has recovered. You're listening here to uh, Twilight Football. Yep. Nick Tabano and Ed Gooden here. Um, we are about 36 hours almost removed from the greatest day of my life, the greatest moment of my life mm. so far. No joking, it's been better than that, actually. Really? Oh, uh, well, this is, if I was to rank all of my sport teams winning championships, I've actually seen quite a few. I've seen one AFL grand final win. I've seen a World Cup win for Italy. I've seen them win the Euros now. I've you seen... were really sentient when that World no, Cup No, I, I was eight. I remember it, but obviously not a... Um... You, were, you were just enjoying the, the not, lights not and like the, the lights and the funny sounds. Yeah, and the, the gold trophy. Um, <laughs> and I've witnessed uh, three NBA championships. From 06 all the also, way Also, 2006 doesn't count. Yeah, but 13, 12 and 13 was quite nice. Yep. Um, and so this, but this has been the one where I've actually probably been able to enjoy it the most when you're sort of in your 20s, you know what I mean? Considering that the last grand final I went to was, and as well as Tom 8, 6, 7, 8 members, the Australian Asian Cup too. So obviously mm-hmm. that was in 2015 as well. So it goes. But this is number one. Yeah, it has to be. This is number one. Especially the, the spectacle that we witnessed afterwards. Oh, on so uh, on the ligon, my throat is like still recovering mm. from just screaming, um, and all the fun we had. Um, I mean, we heard it from Lockie and Pakua, who were with us yesterday. Yeah, so we got the one side of the story. Now we've got ours. Mm. It's long, it was a long day. It was it was a long day. I to start with, I said to Lockie that I was going to be driving him in. Yeah. And, and remind everyone what time we were getting to Ligon. We were, we were trying to get there by 3 a.m. And that was still technically late. Yeah, that was, <laughs> we were like, oh, we're pushing it Yeah, for three. So I woke up at, I woke up at 2.15. I was going to get ready, head to Lockie's house in South Yarra, then drive to Ligon Street, get there by three, whatever. Uh, I woke up at 2.15. I was lying there. I was like, great. Okay, I can maybe sleep in for two or three minutes. That's all good. But then I then I woke up and it was three oh one. I'd I'd had missed calls from three missed calls from <laughs> you, a couple of missed calls from Lockie, and a message at the end saying, "Hey, Edman, all good. I'm I'm just going to get an Uber in." Yeah. I was like, "Ah, oh, shit. Okay. Uh, sorry." Uh, <laughs> but then I was like, uh, "I'll I'll still go." I actually nice. said to myself, "Oh no, I don't think I'll go in." Yeah. Um. But then I thought to myself, oh, "You got the rev up by me though. I yeah. gave you the rev up. You gave me a call." Yeah, because. I woke up, I, I barely slept because I was so excited mm. and I knew I had to be there by 3 a.m. Um, and also because as well, for those that don't know, at Ligon, anywhere that you could book was booked. Yeah. So the only place that everyone knew that was open that you could go to was Brunetti's. Brunetti's, when I went a few days beforehand, they said, we're going to have three TVs. If you know Brunetti's, it's a very long cafe. So there's enough room. It's probably the biggest restaurant on Ligon Street by far with Definitely. the amount of space. And it's a got. chain. Yeah, so they would have one right at the back where they've got sort of their restaurant section. They're going to have one to the side, mm. um, which is sort of near their little coffee bar, and they'll have one at the front, which is actually outside. Yeah. Then we find out the night before that they were not going to have one outside. They were not going to have one to the side. They were only going to have Why? one at the back. Why wouldn't they? Apparently due to COVID restrictions. I don't really know. I'm Fair not going to question it too much. Um, so And they were only going to have 150 in, instead of the promised 200. Now, people caught wind of that and were there from about – Probably people just stayed the whole night outside Brunetti's. Yeah. I know. I think the Calcio boys mm. were there for quite a while. Yeah, and then obviously there was the the man who brought the the projector and went down to the piazza <laughs> down at Argyle Square with an esky underneath. Yeah, and, um, thousands of people congregated down there. It was medlem, but we 
had the secret location. Secret locazione from a, a friend of the yeah. station, uh, Mickey Morcos. Shout out to him and everyone's out, out at Minico. Yeah, he was strolling around in his in his Arsenal kit. Yeah, of all Ma- things, I think it was Emiliano Martinez he had on the back as yeah. well. Um, and so our producer out there, good old Josh Parrish, welcome back to Victoria. Now out of ISO, mm. um, he told us a few days beforehand. Look, Minton Co is showing it because he's just spoken to Michael. Josh, want to go there? I thought, oh, look, you know, I think we'll be okay. But then, as it got close to kickoff, I thought, you know what? I think we're going to have to go to Minton Co. So the night before, I, I, I sent Michael a text and I said, look, mm. book for eight. I was like, tell my family friends coming as well. Book for eight. Um, and just to lock us in, he goes, sure, yeah. no worries. We'll be open at four. So we're waiting outside. Next door to Minton Co is Doc. And Doc, you saw Doc. It was Doc packed. Doc was pumping. And, in, and of course, because they had Toby Green and Stephen Keneally are watching it at yeah, Doc as well. You so. received that news midway through. Yeah. Mickey came up to you and said, there's some GWS boys in there. And I was like, hmm, should definitely not go say hello. Bad no. jokes. Bad jokes. I actually really like Green and Keneally. Um Friends. So anyways, football friends. Well, I just think they're great players. Anyways, mm. so I um, I basically then thought I saw some people that I also that I knew some other friends and I was like, look, Minton Co is showing it. If you know anybody else and they want to come, there's plenty of room. Mm. Just let me know and I'll, I'll set you guys up. So yeah, as uh, as Lockie described it, he's like, it's like you're just doing secret deals at the moment to get everyone to this location. You were because you know how it was like on that little alleyway. Well, you actually, in order to get there, I had to end up getting an Uber. Yeah. And you said, don't put the Mint & Co location down the actual, you yeah. So just put in Doc and then go down the alleyway. My Uber cost $76. Yeah, because you had a bit of a traumatic experience to hey, get there. The Uber was, I called my Uber at about 3, probably 3.10. Wow. 3.15. Took you about an hour. It took me a bloody hour. I call it and it's like, cool, it's 10 minutes away. So I get out of bed, get ready, brush my teeth, all, all good to go. And then I, I look at my phone as I'm just chilling. I'm like, oh, 10 minutes has passed, so he's probably out the front. And then it says 11 minutes to go until he gets here. Yeah. So I, I check where he is, and he's he's at Eureka Sky Deck. Which is not close to uh, Balaclava. No, he's gone backwards. Yeah. He was originally in, like, I don't know, Caulfield, and he's gone to Eureka Sky Deck. So I sent him a message saying, hey, what's, what's up? Is everything okay? Like, what's going on? Yeah doesn't respond he sees it and then he drives and then he starts heading back down and he's at about albert park which is still a while eight minutes away yeah and then he just stops and i'm like everything all good and then he cancels the ride wow yeah so i get another one who's about four minutes away he, came, he along, came straight away came straight away and i got in the uber and i went to push my glasses up as i always do and i didn't have them on my face <laughs> so I, I got i got about a minute and a half away. And you're just like, mate, I, can't I said, say. Mate, I'm, so, I'm so sorry, but is there any chance we can turn around and I go get my glasses? He's like, yeah, no worries. So he was a good guy. He was great. You give him five stars? Yeah, of course. Always give five stars. Nice. I don't think I've ever not given five stars because I don't think I've ever had that bad of a uh, Uber experience. Yeah. Apparently, sorry, we just had apparently a caller, but no one Did actually we? came through. Yeah. I don't know. A ghost caller. Yeah, a ghost caller. Try calling him back, Josh. No, he's anonymous. He's calling the private number. Did he? Yeah. Wow. So we might have an actual gremlin in the system. A gremlin? In the system. Um, so, yeah, so your experience was because you were saying, I'll be there at 10 past. This is 10 past four. Be there 20 past four. And then you ended up getting there around 4.30. Um, and obviously when we got there, great experience down at Minton Co. A few other people that we let know come down. By the time we got there, it was packed. It was packed. Both sort of sections of Minton Co. were full. Um I didn't think if you'd said to me, would you be watching um, the Italy in the Euros final at a Shisha mm. sort of establishment? I would have said that's highly unlikely. But I mean, I think that Minton Co probably was the best venue of the lot. It was really chilled, really nice sort of vibes. Um, a lot of people just there enjoying and having a good time. Um, just not even just Italian fans, just fe- people, football fans just in general. People. Just yeah, people. Just chilling. Um, you know, so we had a, a nice little turnout there. And I'll tell you what, it was some... Some experience. Yeah, it was slapping. For those who didn't go, uh, regretful. Situations yeah. don't allow. Uh, like I've actually just received a uh, received a Twitter DM from uh, from Neil Simons. Uh, he's saying seventy six dollar Uber from Balaclava. Uh, man, I'm from Caulfield, and now I'm pretty happy I didn't go to Ligon. It well, was expensive, I think, not because of the location, but because of the the cancellation. The not even the cancellation, just the. I think it was the the level of people that were interested in getting an Uber at that time. Mm. It was just busy, busy period at busy. that time. It's like the rare busy period that that 
time of the day. Mm. That would never happen at any other time ever. Maybe not for the next four years until the World well, maybe till next year when the World Cup rolls around. Mate, next year World Cup's going to slap so hard. Well, we were discussing it. The World Cup is in November, December next year. So think about, we were freezing yesterday. It was so It's going to be the God. absolute opposite. It's going to be summer. Yeah. It's going to be a winter World Cup over in Qatar. Mm. So we're going to get a summer World Cup and it's just before Christmas. I'll tell you what, getting up at 5 a.m. be a lot easier when the sun's already up. You'll have your shorts on. We'll have our shorts on. Lockie yeah. won't have a problem with that because Lockie, Lockie won't will... have to go deep in his wardrobe to find a pair of pants. No, he won't have to get the Uniqlo coat out <laughs> no, anymore. No, he won't. He just could roll up in a pair of, uh, pair of shorts and a tee. But anyways, talking about the actual um, experience in terms of us being at Live on Ed. Yeah. Um, so obviously, you know, the... the Part that I think that you, Lockie, and Pakur enjoyed the most, because I was very much nervous. I wasn't eating. The pumpkin seeds. <laughs> yeah. You guys ate those pumpkin seeds. like Smashed the, them. You literally you channeled your inner fans at, the, at Jack Edwards Reserve, and you guys were smashing down those mm. pumpkin seeds like no tomorrow, especially yeah. Pakur, being the media manager of Oakley. She, it's like she brought it upon, like sort of said, you know, I'm going to channel that, and I'm going to do it myself. You guys were just powering through. And it seemed like they were just never-ending. They didn't stop. I think Pakul was inspired by, like you said, all the old papus down at Oakley, yeah. sitting around having a couple of CCs before the game at Jack Edwards and just, just chomping yeah. on the ground, chomping, throwing them. Let the birds pick them up later. They were great. Yeah. You had to, there was an art to opening them up and getting the real amount of pumpkin that you wanted. Mm. They didn't taste like pumpkin at all, though. They just were there to nibble on. Just a nib. Yeah. And what did uh, what did Lockie call it? Uh, Passatempo. <laughs> Is that what it's called? Passi tempo, yeah. Is it Josh? No, because he kept going passi tempo, passi tempo. <laughs> oh, oh yes. yes, yes, yes. So there was a joke about Nick Giannopoulos getting extremely wrong on the Football Belongs documentary. Thank you, Nick Giannopoulos. There we go. Yes, yeah, so they're pistachios instead of actual pumpkin pumpkin seeds. Ni- mm, okay. Nick, come on, Nick Giannopoulos. You've done two Walk Boy movies, mate. You should get Walk Boy yeah. 3, you know? Pakur said, Pakur said she know. was very inspired uh, she, I was very inspired. Great pumpkin seeds. Yeah, it was. Yeah. But then, obviously, as well, the game itself. We had a lot of fun. I mean, I was a nervous wreck. Would you have rather that or a three 0 win? Uh, that, in hindsight, yeah, because it was just such a great way to win. Amazing. When the first goal went in, I was, I was just in there like, oh my god, mm. I can't believe this has happened. Mm. But I always had a feeling that this. It was either England were going to win one nil. They weren't going to score again. That no, was hundred percent. No way. But they're right. They were going to win one nil and just kind of, you know, really frustrate Italy. Yes, their way to victory. But you eventually got the goal. Well, we knew it. It was like eventually a goal's got to happen. It just had to. Like England were just doing nothing. Mm. And then when the when Bonucci scored, it was like biblical in there, like because it was like this tension just building and building and building, and then it just like the place exploded. Yeah. Um. And I think the most amazing thing was, and actually, we've got a. Well, welcome back, Josh Parrish. You're not behind a computer anymore. Special you're actually guest. You're back, right, Mike. Yeah, you, you're on. Yeah, so I've just got an editorial co- uh, correction for the uh, uh, the uh, nitpickers, which I'm sure that are in about abundance. the seeds. Yes, Passa Tempo is pumpkin seed, but Nick Giannopoulos did mistakenly say that they were uh, pistachios. pistachios. Right. There so it's Nick Giannopoulos who was wrong, not Lockie. No, Lockie, no was, Lockie, Lockie was, was spot right. on. Lockie was but right. But I think he was yeah. only referencing it because Nick Giannopoulos was Right, because he kept going, passa tempo, passa <laughs> tempo, passa tempo. I was tempo. like, yeah, no, they are passing yeah. it quite quickly. It's fine. Yes, but this yeah. is not independent Scotland, Lockie. You don't have to yeah, worry about that. It's not all about ball speed, Lockie. Yeah. You, know, you don't have to always, Lockie's always pick thinking, up the tempo. He's always thinking about balls, isn't he? He always, <laughs> he always is. Hey, Lockie, uh, Josh, we'll get you back in a bit. We'll talk a little bit about the game and a bit about what happens at Wembley a little bit later on um, because we'll just wrap up our sort of next few minutes, our experiences <laughs> down at Ligon. Um, yeah. And then the one thing I think that struck us both was sort of the dialogue that we were having throughout the game. I think that's one thing I've started to rem- reminisce on a little bit. I, like I went to bed last night, mm. absolutely pooped. And pooped. I was just thinking about the dialogue and I was remembering certain things. Mm. First of all, Pakua was just an absolute like machine with her insults and everything. Like yeah. she was the most vocal out of everyone in the whole place. Her voice is also quite loud as well. Yeah. Not in a bad way, but if, it, it just, it gets to where it needs yeah. to go. And if you listen to her in on twilight, her voice was cooked yesterday. Like yeah. her, her voice box had gone through the ringer. And um, there's one thing that I noticed Bakul was doing was she'd get really excited mm. and then she'd be like, Whoa, whoa, whoa! Just, just like calm down. It's like it's like she's saying, just it's okay, calm down. It's like it's like a bit of self talk. She would get. We were sitting on, uh, like like in cafes where you have one like against the wall seat. We had that situation. Yeah, like a little booth sort of. Yeah, a little booth. 
uh, she would just just leap up onto the booth yeah. just so quickly, just throw her legs up. Yeah, just like I couldn't I couldn't stand up as quick <laughs> as she was jumping onto the booth. Yeah, and then uh, we had you know Lockie that was just Lockie was just literally Lockie was Fatsa. very Lockie was very nervous. He was probably as nervous as me because of mm. his Scotland roots. And yourself, you were just there vibing, having a good time, telling us I about your just... conversations with your mum at the time, who was in England. Yeah, and well, your mum, who was openly rooting for almost not for England. Yeah, well, my mum messaged me just being like, uh, I, I didn't realise that she knew this much about football, but she just messaged saying they should bring on Jack Grealish. <laughs> oh, no, not even that. Just get Jack, Jack on. on. <laughs> I was like, Jack Grealish? And she says, yep. I said, do you like him? She just said, make stuff happen. I've watched a lot of football. <laughs> All right, well, mom. you're from the. You've spent time in the Midlands. Yeah. So he is like a Midlands hero, being from Aston Villa or playing for Aston Villa. Sorry, he's he technically is. Irish. Um, we won't get down that Jack Irish that, that right rabbit hole too much. But um, anyways, I remember the one bit that stuck out for me was when we go head to the penalty shootout. Mm. Was when Bellotti missed and Harry Maguire scored. I remember turning to you all and saying, "We're f." You said, "That's it. We're gone. We're done." We I thought gone. this is it. And then I remember just that feeling of like, you know, all right, Bonucci scores the pen and then Donnarumma, well, Rashford hits the post. Mm. And then we're all just like, hold on a second. Hold on a just, moment. Just, no, 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 just, just wait a second. That was really the turning point. I yeah. mean, the Harry Maguire penalty was one of the best penalties uh, you'll see. Not the camera. It killed the camera. It actually destroyed the camera. Yeah. I and think... then, yeah, it'll just change from there. Yeah. That was like bad luck. Bit of karma. It was like the, but... B- the BBC said, all right. Now you have to miss all your penalties. <laughs> you're knocked out on camera. Now you're going to miss. As long as the slab head narrative is still being enforced, yeah. then we're fine. Um, sorry, go on. Well, I was just going to say that I, in that moment, even though I consoled you and said it's all going to be okay, I also <laughs> believe that that was it. Yeah. Uh, but, like, I, I still don't understand why Raheem Sterling wouldn't have taken a penalty. No. Because I think he take doesn't he take them for City as well? Josh, does he? Sterling take pens? Yeah, have you ever seen him take a penalty? But you would have thought maybe he would have t- stepped up and in that moment, being somewhat now an experienced. He's pretty experienced for his age. He's like what twenty five now. 26? Raheem Sterling. He about, well, he started at isn't seventeen. He, isn't he older? No, he's not. Raheem Sterling's not that old. I mean, he's made his debut. For, oh, actually, he's about only twenty six years old. Yeah, because he debuted for Liverpool in twenty twelve at oh seventeen. My God. Yeah, he was so young. Harry um, Kane's only twenty seven. Yeah, and Harry uh, Harry Kane. Harry Kane. <laughs> I, I kept thinking Harry Kane was thirty two. Nah. His body's 32. How is, how is Raheem Sterling 26? Harry Kane's legs are 32. He's cooked. Raheem Sterling could honestly go down as one of the greatest English players of all time. Probably. By the time he's done. He could have had a World Cup and a Euros under his belt if he hadn't, you know. Now that it hasn't happened. If he hadn't flopped his lines. Anyways. Um, so moving on, then obviously the moment as well which stuck with me was um, during that penalty shootout, we had a couple of intruders. Yeah, a couple of couple of folks, a couple of walk-ins. Yeah, for, I think might have been heading to work or something, and they just happened to see that there was a spectacle, and they came in, stood stood directly behind us, and just started cheering for England. Mm. And you know, I, I don't think they had any affiliation with England. There was nothing to uh, show that they were English in terms of kits or scarves. They were just saw that the room was packed with Italian fans and just decided to be a bit bit a bit naughty and. Uh, purposefully antagonizing us Italian fans. Mm-hmm. And I was not happy about that at all. And me as a passionate, uh, non- you know, Azzurri-blooded man, I said to myself, how dare you? Yeah, absolutely. And then obviously they won. And I remember I got my phone out for Jorginho's penalty because I wanted to capture the the moment of it. Mm. And obviously he missed. So I deleted the story very quickly. <laughs> um, and then I didn't bother getting my phone out in the moment that uh, Bakaya Saka stepped up because I thought he was going to score, I thought, okay, we're going, like, this is going beyond the five. Yeah. But I, ne- I think that moment when Donnarumma saved that ball, it, it's it's like it all happened in slow motion because this moment of, like, everyone just sort of rose. Like, I remember, you know, chairs, like, flew. <laughs> you know, I just <laughs> hugged everyone in sight. One of, one of my mates, um, Lucas, who was there, and actually it's on Pakua's story, I remember just, like, just grabbing him, big hug. You know, and it was just yeah. like this moment of like, we've we've done it. Like, we've done it. We've done it. And I can yell out all the different expletives that were coming out of my mouth after we did it. A lot of F and done it, F and this, we've done it. Oh my God, we've done it. And then there was just pure bedlam to get out the door. And the poor waiter at Mitsuko is like, you're going to pay? Yeah, well, everyone, everyone just read. There was probably, I don't know how many people were in there. Oh, it would have been easily about probably 150, 200 people. Not, oh, no, not maybe. maybe 100, a bit less. Maybe 100. But they all just bolted out, and I just thought to myself, "Okay, we 
we need to pay for our coffees because they're going to be in debt. But I don't understand why they wouldn't do this beforehand. Why wouldn't they? Yeah. Anyway. Regardless, the hospitality was fantastic. Josh is back in. Quick producer fact check. Yes. Uh, Ed, do you want to guess what Raheem Sterling's record is in the last five penalties he's taken for City in shootouts and a couple Zero. of play? Zero. One out of five. Wow. So maybe that's it. Because mm-hmm. Marcus Rashford's a pretty good penalty. He's taker. very good. Yeah. It's Surprising like the, that he missed. This is per transfer marked, and that's yeah. over the last three seasons. He's taken five penalties for City in shootouts and you know a couple in open yeah, play, that's... and he's only scored one. Look, wow. I don't I don't understand the dialogue of uh, oh they should have had. I say that after bringing up the Sterling thing, right? But I think there's young young kids should be just as good as taking penalties. Well, I mean, as, it's as the experienced people. It's an art. At the end of the day, it's just about having composure in the moment. Yeah. Like Harry Maguire and Leo Bonucci are not good finishers, but hey, mm. if you can step up and kick a ball twelve yards, yeah. and put in the corner and block out all that external pressure, like for me, I feel I, the all the stuff that happened afterwards, just dovetailing from our experience, talking about what actually the experience that Paul Rashford, Saka, and Sancho have gone through over the past twenty four hours, forty eight mm. hours, is just abhorrent. Yeah. Uh, you know, just terrible sort of sentiment from the England fans. You know, that's just not on. You know, that sort of abuse and everything else. We're in the bloody 21st century, for God's sake. You know, so that's yeah. just not on. Um, we feel for them. You know, we're here at FNR are firmly against racism. Mm. And uh, we hope that that can get stamped out. But moving back to the game, we then ran out to Ligon. Actually, out onto Ligon Street. Yeah. And I tell you what, Ed. That was some of the most fun I've ever had. And Lockie was mentioning it yesterday about how I, I listened to the podcast on the way and he goes, Nick seems like the mayor of Ligon Street because he was hugging everyone that he saw and he's yeah. getting us so many people. I didn't recognize that many people. It's just that... You, we probably ran into about four or five of your uh, friends. Or... I reckon I reckon all up I probably hugged about been over 10 people. Yeah, that you knew? Yeah, people that I knew. Mm. Um, there was a few, obviously, I know better than others, people that I'm closer with than others. Yeah. Uh. Um, and I guess there was one moment in particular where one of my um, one of the guys, call him mate, acquaintance of mine, um, yep. a- Andrew Romato, who I went to school with, he um he it was when we were sort of near Seven Eleven. He was that guy. He's like oh, Nick, yeah. and he gave me a hug. And when he hugged me, he accidentally whacked me on the ear, just like <laughs> in the moment. And then as like a reaction, like as like, like a reflex, I smacked him on the ear as well, just like because an, an ear for an ear, yeah. Because like it was just like we're both just like oh my god we won yeah and then afterwards I'm like oh my god my ear is messed like I it have was been like slapped like you know when you get slapped across the side of the head mm. it feels painful and your ear just goes like it's ringing for a while it's a bit of a reality check yeah and then I think the moment for me that stood out for the most was the uh, my favorite part of it the pronto cement mixer <laughs> which. I got word. I saw it on a few stories. Yeah, he was he or she, whoever was driving at that time. They did like a driver rotation. Still... It was like you know those twenty four hour car races where they do those. Le Mans. Yeah, Le Mans. Like it's the Ford versus Ferrari movie essentially, where they swap drivers and a driver goes to sleep for a few hours. Yeah, and they just they just do a lapse of Ligon. And this this cement mixer was just going up and mm. down. And the guy you could see he's he's pulling the horn. Well, Highway and, Patrol tried to pull yeah, him over. Yeah, he couldn't stop him. He was going up side streets, coming back around, yeah. and he just was loving life. I saw a picture on, I think it was I think it was the Guardian, maybe the Herald Sun, of the Mustang that we ran into. Yeah, and yeah. the number plate was, uh, no, the Maserati was uh, Maserati. The, yeah, the Maserati was fresh. But the Mustang, that was a, the Monaro that we saw, and it pulled up oh, like a, right. No, it wouldn't be. That was a Monaro. Monaro is a Holden. You sure? Holden Monaro. No, it wasn't a Monaro. Sorry, it was a Mustang. It was a Mustang, but it was a Camaro or something like that. Some, I don't know. Anyways. <coughs> he just uh, stopped in the middle of the road. Yeah, but it was like right outside where we were standing and just everyone just ran over to the Mustang and everyone just sort of blocked it. <laughs> Surrounded in. it. It was just a fantastic moment. I mean, seeing all that outpouring of emotion of so many people. And I think for me as an Italian fan, like I think a lot of people might misconstrue it. And some people say a lot of these fans are, you know, Euro snobs and this and that because, hey, why aren't you going to the A-League or going to the NPL because mm. you're Italian fans? End of the day, this is a moment where it's more about like identity and being proud of where you come from because a lot of people that went, there's a lot of people that probably aren't really football fans. There are people that I know that went that definitely weren't. People just went yeah. for the experience. It's an experience. End of the day, it's a spectacle, right? It's like if if the Australian, if the Australian boomers. Yeah, there'll the be a lot of people team. that get around them if they make the gold medal game. Yeah. If they like, if they've got a gold medal game at you know nine p.m. on a Friday night, chances are you're probably going to head down to the pub. 
watch it. Yeah. Like, it'll be great. But that doesn't mean then someone's going to say, oh, why aren't you watching the NBL? Yeah. It's not the well, same. For instance, man. right, think about it like this. Mac Horton, for instance, the Olympics, right? <laughs> he's gone for gold. Say he's going for gold and say, I don't know. I don't even know what he qualified for in the NBL. Say it's like the 400-meter freestyle, right? Yeah. Everyone's going to watch it because it's like it's an Aussie going for gold. Mm. And everyone's going to be like, I really, really, really want Matt Horton to win this, right? Because it's like, this is amazing. Mm. But you're not going to turn around and say, but why aren't you watching swimming all year round? Like, why haven't you been, you know, tuning into Come on, Prime? Amazon why aren't you Prime? watching the World Championships? Yeah, why aren't you watching the FIBA qualifiers and all that? That's basketball. Sorry, the uh, FINA, I think it is. I don't even know what they're... Sorry, this is... A bit sad. That's exactly what I mean. I don't oh, even yeah, know much about swimming. But, you can, you're allowed to pick and choose. Yeah. And the thing was, the thing was for me is that there was just so many people there that embraced that sense of, you know, just who they are. And I think that's one thing, you know, we've seen here. Unfortunately, with football here is there was this time and a very long time where we st- there was this stupid ruling about, you know, stamping out, you know, identity and all that sort of stuff with NDIS. And it's just a – or NCIP, sorry. I'm getting it wrong. NCIS. NCIS. Oh, I said NCIS. NCIS. Yeah. NCIP. We would have needed NCIS to get around it. NCIP. Um and I guess now how that's gone and people actually embracing the heritage is a great thing. Yeah. And I think that there was just this feeling of, you know, a lot of Italians were so ridiculed and so upset after they missed the World Cup. I remember the amount of sofa expletives, like, shit mm. that I copped during that period. It frustrated the hell out of us because as much as I go for Australia, there's that period that, you know, we are still, we're still Italians. Like, we're still people that go for it. It's like... Any sort of Australian, that there's a lot of Australians that go for Croatia, a lot that go for any other nations as well, mm. like you know, Macedonia, etc. All the different um, ethnicities. And the fact that, you know, we had to sit there through 2018 and, and miss the whole World Cup while it was such a great spectacle and we didn't get a chance to embrace that and we were the brunt of the world <laughs> jokes. Oh, Italy didn't make the World Cup. The story in itself is fantastic. Yeah. Didn't make the World Cup. Rock bottom. Roberto Mancini comes in, revolutionises the team, makes them the most watchable team in world football just completely changes perspectives and as well think about their COVID situation, how, you know, so many people died in Italy last year. That was one of the hardest hit nations in the whole world. Mm. You know, you think about um, 16 months ago, I remember seeing videos and it, it actually, you know, thinking about it actually makes me a bit emotional. Was seeing Italians on their balconies singing to each other whilst they're locked in their apartment buildings and that sense of passion. But now it's been all brought out in this team and they understand, like they're, they're representing everyone, not just in Italy, but all around the world. Mm. There were scenes in America like that, scenes in the UK, scenes everywhere. And I think it was just this moment where everyone was able, and especially even being Melbourneian, we recognise this as well, being locked up for so long through all the lockdowns we've been through. And obviously I feel for the Sydney siders who are watching this who weren't able to experience it yesterday. Being able to be around people and experience mm. that. Like we haven't been able to do that in how long? No. Like something like that. I mean, it was perfect timing. It was. It was fantastic. It was. The, it was like you couldn't have, you couldn't have timed it better because it wasn't a situation where there was two or three cases a day and no. blah blah blah. We even had a case for. Well, we had know. a case overnight, but that's like very low risk because yeah. they were already in isolation. But the thing is, the thing is about that about that moment. You know, I think as well is that you know. We, we, I think there's one, one praise I want to pass on is that the police were, I thought were fantastic. They were great. Night. They didn't antagonize. They didn't, you know, try and shut it down. They mm. patrolled it. Yeah. They were, yes, they had their horses. Yes. They had a lot of cop cars around, but it's not like, you know, they, you know, were actively trying to shut it down. They were just making sure it was nothing mm. r- ridiculous was going on to the point where people's safety can be endangered. Yeah. The people who were endangering their safety was that put? Was that guy kept trying to do a three point turn on bloody Ligon Street? Where the low, yeah, <laughs> you can't do a three point turn on Ligon Street. You're not going to make that. Happen. But so, it, it, it was just well, it was well, well handled. Yeah, and I mean, it's a shame that the city of Melbourne weren't able to organise a proper event. And I think that they probably would have if COVID settings permitted, and probably mm. hopefully for the World Cup in eighteen months' time they can do that. But yeah, I've got to give the cops credit; they did a great job. Yeah. Um, there were a few people that got arrested. You know, they did some silly things. Yes, there's mm. always going to be a few. But for the vast majority, the thousands of people, I think that there easily would have been close to 10,000, 12,000 people all up that probably have piled Do you in. reckon, really? Yeah, 100%. I mean, the Piazza, like, it was the thing that I think it was also the nature of the fans as well. Yeah. I hate to say it, and I and I don't want to speculate and do that kind of thing, but if those were England supporters who had won, mm. it, it, it wouldn't have surprised me if there was more trouble. Yeah. All right, well... Let's 
take a short break here because we'll talk a bit about that mm. sort of the sentiments, but instead, well, the, the scenes that happened over at Wembley. Because there were some pretty ugly scenes with the fans that were there, yeah. the, the English fans in particular. We'll bring Josh in in just a moment as well. It's good to have Josh back in, even though I've just heard his voice after his mini stay in Canberra, which we saw him have a rush to the border. He got back just in time the because scramble. of special thanks to the gum, the gum sticker, Reese, Reese Hawker, who <laughs> stuck his gum in the right Allegedly. place and then told Allegedly. Josh. Hey, Josh, I think you should get back because I've just Who'd stuck... you fly with? I think it was Jetstar. Qantas. Rex. Rex. Heard Rex. they do biggies now. <laughs> Did you know that? Yeah. Well, he flew the airplane that uh, sponsors Jordan Pickford's arms. <laughs> Rex. Let's take a short break here on uh, Twilight Football. We'll get back into plenty more from the Euros and also a bit of a touch on what's going on here in Australia. Some exciting news for Melbourne Victory fans. So uh, don't go anywhere. What? A banger. Slapper. This is uh, Una Estate Italiana here on uh, Twilight Football. Yep. Uh, by uh, Gianna Nanini and Eduardo Benato. This is the 1990 World Cup anthem from when Italy hosted it 31 years ago. And also the song that a good friend of ours at the station, he posted this in one of the Italian football fans groups. Vito Doria was blasting out of his car good on you, <laughs> uh, yesterday going down Ligon. And it was a shame not to see Vito down there. Um, Surprising too. Yeah, and he did say on one of his Facebook posts, he said that he watched it with his family and he posted a lovely video after the game with him watching it with his dad. Yeah, he was um, uh, he was vocal. Very vocal, <laughs> uh, but very much very much warranted. Very exciting day. Uh, yeah. If you've been living under a rock for the past 36 hours, yes, Italy won the Euros. Josh, you're back yes. just in time for the celebrations to continue. Uh, you've had a bit of a mad 48 hours. I remember 48 hours ago mm-hmm. getting messages whilst I was at work saying, oh, my God, I have to run for the border, basically. And I only <laughs> knew the, about, about the border closure because Reese Hawker, Saved our your ass. Ba- behind the scenes mastermind, <laughs> the uh, gum man, messaged our group chat and said, uh, uh, with a nice little uh, DHHS screenshot, which I, I probably should have had tweet alerts on my mm. phone uh, for that account after uh, all the, the New South Wales stuff. Well, look, I'm not going to make this a, a political thing, but I was coming from a territory with zero cases in 300 and something days. So but it I, sits I didn't expect... within New South Wales. Yeah, within well, New South Wales. So te- well, technically you're in New South Wales. No, it's not technically. You're basically like... In fact, you're, technically it's the opposite. You're it's, te- it. it's, it's technically like he is uh, in San Marino, but he's just in Italy. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> uh, are people from San Marino celebrating the Euros? Probably. Actually, okay. That's they probably are. They don't example. celebrate much with their national <laughs> team. They lose 10-0 <laughs> every week. That's true, that's true. Um... Josh, I mean, you watched it from a more neutral perspective yesterday, at least from the comfort of your home and didn't have to worry about, you know, the sort of the, I guess, the overriding emotion of Italian sentiment that we mm-hmm. had and everything else. And we're able to sort of gain a bit of a neutral perspective. You spoke about a lot yesterday about the actual game, but let's talk a bit about the fan behavior. Uh, we'll talk about mm-hmm. it off air about how disgraceful it was, yeah. uh, especially in the pregame. Um, just Terrible scenes. And we, at we're not talking Ligon, we're talking Wembley here. Yes, yes. We're not, <laughs> there's no, there's no way we're talking about Ligon. Uh, Ligon no, was no. fantastic uh, from all I saw. I wish I could have been there, but I was able to follow uh, some of the stuff happening in England over Twitter. And look, I think having an 8 p.m. kickoff time uh, local was a terrible <laughs> idea because it just gives people more of a chance to get tanked during the day before the game. Uh, but aside from the scheduling, this was one of the most diabolically organized mass sporting events of the last couple of decades. And honestly, I'm actually extremely relieved that we're not here today in mourning talking about some kind of crowd crush situation. Yeah. You know, wasn't there some sort of security breach or something? Yeah. So yeah. fans without tickets were just overwhelming the stewards and running through barriers and, and crashing the game. And it was it was clearly happening en masse. I mean, uh, Wembley put out some sort of statement saying there's no isolated incidents and that those people would be ejected. But based on what I saw and what journalists were reporting from the actual stadium, that was absolutely not the case. This was supposed to be uh, a reduced capacity event, but it was the opposite. Uh, people couldn't sit in the seats that they had bought for the game because people were in those seats. And, uh, you know, there was standing room only, two people to a seat in some places, a lot of fans standing in the stairwells and watching from the concourse because they couldn't get in. 
Uh, there were fans breaking into VIP areas and areas with players' families watching from, oh which wow. obviously all the social distancing stuff went completely out the window. There were a few fans that actually ran through the press area and were being chased by stewards. <laughs> it was complete chaos, mm. absolute chaos. And, you know, England has prided itself on on being one of the more enlightened nations where it comes to crowd control and exerting something of a softer touch. But I, I think, uh, you know, they they underestimated the kind of fan fervour and the... Uh, the craziness that would surround this game, given there's been basically an 18-month build-up to this yeah. and so many people frustrated by the COVID lockdowns and this was always set up to be the you know the uh, biggest party in the history of London and fans absolutely trashed the, the place and, look, I'm, I'm just glad that, you know, there weren't too many injuries uh, yeah. from, this, mm. from the looks, from the, from the sounds of things. And this, this kind of shows that uh, this is kind of a demonstration uh, at home in an English-speaking country with a uh, huge media presence for the first time, showing what England away fans ob- often get up to when they travel. You know, they, they don't don't usually trash their own city. Usually right. they exercise a little bit more restraint when it's, you know, mm. their hometown. But when it's England away or lay, it's often, you know, what we saw in Marseille during the Euros, uh, you know, chairs being thrown through restaurant windows and, uh, just bottles lying yeah. in the streets and broken glass. So, uh, I mean, I, this was a diabolical uh, you know, situation. It could have ended tragically. It's it's terrible because you said you think England being pioneers in this situation because of the situation they went through with Hillsborough, you know, yeah. however long ago that was now. They are the ones that have had to suffer greatly due to a situation of, you know, poor security, you mm. know, fans stri- like, you know, stampeding essentially on the ground, but people unfortunately dying. And when you talk about that, that is... Unbelievable that something like that could actually happen in a stadium like Wembley, which is mm. one of the best in the world. You'd think, Euro final, eyes of the world on us. We need to be at the best possible. COVID situation as well, reduced capacity. And the stage managed capacity of, of UEFA, the whole force of that entire organisation behind them, uh, you'd think it would be a little more, bit more sterile and tightly controlled. This is often the opposite that people complain about, these events that you can't do anything. You can't yeah. stand up out of your seat because you get people, um, you know, security people on, on top of you. But I think one of the issues with having a big game at Wembley, and they haven't had a final at Wembley of this magnitude, not an international final for a long, long time, not since 96, yeah, I suppose. the first of the new Wembley. And yeah. it's the first of the new Wembley. But the issue is there's actually uh, residential um, apartments and housing quite close to the stadium. So rather than having the kind of ring of steel that they usually have around these massive um, new stadiums for World Cups and so forth. Look at Russia. It's just deserted for miles around. Yeah. So they can basically set up several security checkpoints on the way in and make it very tightly controlled. If you cut people off by, from that distance, you're actually impeding people coming to and from their houses. Mm. So uh, there's an issue with the setup there. And I don't think England are going to host another major tournament final for quite some time as a result. I don't want to be that guy and go for Australian patriotism about how we deal with stadiums, especially in the wake of the recent, you know, how with COVID capped crowds, etc. cetera. Um, the MCG has a lot of residential sort of place, especially on the north side, the east mm-hmm. Melbourne side. I know mm-hmm. there's a big Yarra Park section and everything, but the way that they deal with it in terms of, you know, you know, it obviously have been worked at the MCG, yeah. how they've set it up recently in terms of security and everything else. It is so tight that it is impossible to even think about stampeding on the ground because yeah. you get past the first wave. If you don't have a ticket, you're not getting past the second. Like well, they, they will... there's, I think it's also the fact that there's barriers in the – like barriers are part of the actual yeah, ground. absolutely. I don't know what the setup is like at You'd at have Wembley. to think they'd have the turnstile. Like you'd have to think, you know, scan the ticket, turnstile, security mm. there as well yeah, to make it, sure if you're jumping over it, you're – Speared to the ground almost. Yeah, because it, it looks like you don't. You obviously don't want to make funnel points because that's when you no. have crushes and stuff. But you want to have a level of, you know, only only two people at a time can get through this section or or whatever. So the MCG has always been good at that. Also, the fact the MCG is so enormous that and it's a massive circle as well also helps. Yeah, I think I think Wembley's a ninety thousand seat stadium though, but I think it's very it's very tall. True. And it's very just kind of... And it was largely the ground level stands, the low, yeah, lower right, level that yeah. were being crushed. Um, so, you know, I, I guess there's a, a natural um, prevention of a kind of Hillsborough situation because mm. fans can actually escape onto the pitch if they absolutely need to, uh, which is what happened with Hillsborough is the way fans were put in an upper tier and they mm. had nowhere to go. Yeah. yeah. So um, there's obviously a, a just a 
geographic kind of yeah. Yeah. difference. It's just, a, just the timing as well. You mentioned the fact this is an 18-month build-up. Yeah. They just, like my mum was in the UK, she was talking about it, how she's so glad that she can now just go out without any, pretty much without any restrictions. Most people have had their vaccines and most people are of the, of the understanding that if you go outside and you get COVID, there are measures in place to ensure that you aren't going to die, mm. essentially. So everyone's just out and about now. Everyone's cruising. And there's, just, yeah, you know, Europe, Freedom yeah. Day yeah. coming up, with which is in, when they're rolling back week. any remaining yeah. restrictions despite sort of increasing infection numbers because you can still get it if you're vaccinated. Yeah, the thing is it's the... We've not going full epidemiology here of what's happened in England. It's the fact that there's more cases, but there's less deaths and less hospitalizations yeah. as a result of it. Obviously, it's not good to have your cases going mm. up, but people are getting vaccinated. It's like a, a race that's like... Oh well, we'll just go get vaccinated yeah. here. Well, you got to wait. To, well, to getting... bring to bring it back <laughs> to kind of a football um, related discussion is, I think it also not just a poor security arrangement, but it also points to, um, I think, a quite deeply ingrained cultural problem among the uh, England fan base. It's not the, necessarily the same sort of people who turn up to kind of big six Premier League. No, matches. there's a demographic difference there. Often these fans, and you see it on the banners that they bring to the stadium, in the England flags with names of clubs and and towns, um, like mm. on the, you know, the, the St George's Cross, um, or in the in the corners or whatever. And it's it's people from um, you know very kind of rough working class areas in some restri- uh, some respects, like Grimsby and places like that. Well, Sunday League Conference, yeah, you know, exactly. It- um, and you know, it's. A very raucous um, atmosphere, of course, but it's also uh, quite a poisonous one at it's times. Nasty. When it's nasty. It, it has toxic. a nasty edge. It has a toxic edge. There's a lot of, um, and, you know, there was various reports of this, but there was, not only was there, you know, uh, way too many people in the ground and chaos caused as a result, there was also scuffles breaking out between fans. Yeah, they were people, brawling amongst themselves. Yeah, there, was, there were brawls. Uh, you know, there was a lot of racist and homophobic insults flying around. And this extends out to uh, the abuse that the players are receiving on social media. And I, I don't think it's easy for a player to go out and perform at their highest level when you know that the backing from the stands is so conditional uh, mm. and based on the result. And you're absolutely going to cop it if, you know, you miss a penalty. I think the, the England fan base has an ability to be, like you said, like the nasty, the toxic. But I think it's like they're just such sore losers as well. And they also don't understand that even if the team doesn't win, they're still the same team. And they'll they'll come back knowing that it's not like you can't isolate specific people in these groups and be like, okay, you can no longer support England. No. These guys are going to support England. No matter no what. matter what happens, yeah. it's always going to be the same. Before we take a quick break, um, it was like it was what we said yesterday. I really think the England squad is very likable. Like the players in itself, yeah, are, they're all they're great. a very likable squad. You I, want them to do well. Honestly, I was supporting Italy uh, yesterday morning, but I found it difficult to kind of take any real joy from the the manner in which they lost because I just knew what the consequences yeah, were going to be. Yeah, that's see that's and the especially thing. given the, the the players that missed in the shootout. Mm. Um and you know a couple of them especially Rashford in particular has been attacked by the tabloid press and uh there's been a lot of racist dog whistles in in his direction. Um you, you just know what the the blowback's going to be. So I, I these guys are incredibly likable and incredibly, you know, socially mm. conscious and responsible people you know it's not like the kind of uh arrogant uh golden boys of, of english squads past so i found it very difficult three. to kind of take uh any kind of shout and yeah. it or pleasure in the in the I, win. I found the most pleasure and especially lucky and i and i both found the most pleasure in thinking about in the, the fans being sad and the and pundits especially yeah, especially the pundits in the oh mud. my god in we just yelled game. out that many different names in the mud. We're not going to go through them all. <laughs> but anyways. Uh, uh, I think Rio Ferdinand is the, uh, maybe the yeah. clearest example. He's put himself the, out there. He and Gary Neville. The yeah. thing, can I, I just want to touch on something really quickly as well. Is, uh, you know, obviously at the start of the game, players taking a knee. Mm. I think it's just it's just a standard thing that now has to be done. It's, yeah. it's expected. It's it's just what. It's like how we should have welcome to country in every single yeah. game here. Any sporting event should uh, have welcome absolutely. to country. Obviously, anyone who boos that is a terrible human being. Yeah, and you, you should not. If be I have to, watch to hear politics don't belong in sport again, I just feel like just telling you the, like then you, you're just a, you, a dumbass. Mm. Like straight up, you're a dumbass if you think that's the case because 
it does belong yeah. in sport. It's a great place to convey a message. Take it out of you. Yeah. No, you can't. There's and politics also, at everything. In everything, in friendship groups, in yeah. everything, family. and also doing nothing um, or ignoring the problem is also inherently political. Oh, you are <laughs> if if you do nothing, it's like there's a book called like How to Be Anti Racist, and like if you, I know we have to go to a break really quick, a book called How to Be Anti Racist, where if you're not anti racist, then you are racist. Yeah, Pierce Morgan, yeah, has been calling out taking the knee, all those types of things, as calling it political and you know part of the woke agenda and all that type of stuff. And then he goes out and condemns the racist abuse that was received by the players mm. after the game. That's one of the more hypocritical things I've ever heard in my life. Yeah. Especially from Piers Morgan. From Piers Morgan. And there were other people as well. I'm not familiar with their names. But it's just, what are you what are you talking about? Yeah. And you know what? There are a lot of people that sort of were piggybacking, a lot of controversial figures in the UK that were piggybacking off the... The national team as a way to, you know, oh, get behind mm. them on the bad wagon now, not looking at Boris Johnson, um, who quite frankly just has no care for football and just started, oh, Harry Kane, you finally scored. Yeah. Come on, In a video sh- that was definitely, definitely. pre-planned, yeah. definitely recorded after the goal had happened and they went back and did it. But that just frustrated me. So, look, as we said, England squad itself, I think there's a lot of likable figures. Mm. I think there's a very, I think there's a coach, despite his flaws as a coach. I think he's a very likable Mate, guy. I if if you're looking but at a coach, there there hasn't been a more successful coach for England in a very long no, time in in world football in an in international world football for probably the last. Well, Roberto Mancini's pretty years. successful. I mean, he's barely lost a game. Yeah. So no, but if we're just talking about, is there anyone else who you're looking at and being like, okay, that coach brought the team to a semi final of a World Cup? And then also final of the Roberto Euros. Mancini's gone undefeated for 34, 35 I'm not, games. I, I'm not. I'm totally acknowledging Roberto <laughs> Mancini as the best international manager in the world. He definitely is right now. But Gareth Southgate, people keep He'd talking about there. his flaws and his problems. He'd be up there for sure. What else? What more does he have to do? No, there's nothing really. Well, I mean, just win one. That's what he's got to do. He's got to win one. Yeah, he's I, getting closer and closer, but he's got to win yeah, one eventually. I think he is an excellent manager, and I think uh, and like he has his tactical downfalls. Sure, every every manager does. For sure, but. To do what he has done, he deserves absolutely so much a lot of credit for that. I think he, he deserves a knighthood. He probably will get one. He will get. You know, I think that did there's Marcus, a lot. Marcus Rashford got a knighthood, didn't he? I think he did for his service, mate. Marcus Rashford's one of the most likable people in the world. He's one of the mm. great. He should be getting Nobel Peace Prizes for like not speaking, saying that with any sort of satire or yeah. sarcasm. He actually should with what he's done in England, feeding the homeless and feeding so many different kids and. Um, and everything else he's done through his, his philanthropy work is just unbelievable. Mm. Um, Ed, let's take a quick break. When we come back, we'll uh, we'll wrap it up. We've got Paco Radio starting at 7. Exciting show. We'll get into that one a little bit yeah. later on. But uh, back in just a second here on Twilight Football. For those who didn't, uh, or for those who were with us <laughs> during the ad break. You saw us having some shots. Yeah, sure. Was taking a couple dimes. Yeah. Uh, Thank you, Aussie Hez, saying give us a dunk. Also, thank you for Pakua for saying ad graphic not up. Uh, this is a part of the show where we finally get to acknowledge the Twitch chat. Aussie Hez has been popping off. Uh, Sorry for not getting to you early, Aussie Hez. We've, yeah, we've, been seeing, we've been seeing the comments. We waited way. for a break in conversation, but it just didn't quite get to it. Didn't really come. Uh, I tuned into Aussie Hez's stream the other day. Good stuff. Great. Yeah. I enjoyed it. Really fun. Just enjoyed Just nice. Very chill. That's what we like to hear. Lovely. Nice stuff. Hey, uh, Ed. Good news today for Melbourne Victory fans. They don't yeah. have to go to Marvel Stadium anymore. Um, so the that. big news is that their contract with Marvel for, I think it's five home games a season, is officially over. So 15 years at Marvel comes to an end. Um, no, not in the MCU, but as in at their little foray. It's Telstra Dome, Eddie Had Stadium, Marvel Stadium. Yeah. Uh, rest in peace to there. Obviously, it's a very famous venue for Victory fans, having won two grand finals that venue having also witnessed a heartbreaking grand final loss in 2010. Um, but, I mean, recently, especially having been to Victory's games for work last season mm. and seeing how the crowd f- numbers have just dropped off dramatically, obviously because of, of COVID hits, has hit it like a ton of bricks, but also the, and performances don't help. But they've gone from, you know, having in most games at least a half fill Marvel State, about 25,000 mm. fans, to... Maybe lucky to have. I think the best crowd they had was for the derby, and that was maybe fourteen. And yeah. they had some games. I remember against Western Sydney, they might have had five. So it looked really, really dull inside that fifty-five thousand seat the, arena. The, the five-game contract. 
it, it felt like a lot more than five games. Felt it? like ten. It felt, it felt like every week. Yeah. It was so bad. And Be- I've been saying for years, mate, why are we playing games of yeah. football here? It's so dumb. Just play more, name. Etihad Stadium is honestly the first stadium that will become redundant <laughs> in Melbourne. Well, if you knocked it down and just built, it's a, being it's being redeveloped. They need to redevelop it by knocking it down and building something <laughs> completely new. Well, they're redeveloping. Obviously, Marvel Stadium is owned by the AFL, um, so that's half the reason why it's still yeah. around. But also, as well, the Victorian government has just pledged extra funding to redevelop it and make it more modern. They've started to do that by making a mural as well, the Ben Simmons mural of him in a Boomer's jersey, which he still hasn't actually worn yet. Have you seen the the four and twenty pie ad with yeah. Ben, ben Simmons? Ben Simmons hits the three. Yeah, you give a bit. Oh, it's it, I, every time you watch ESPN, that ad's on every time. No, not even that. The the one where it says, uh, oh the um the the poster, the with, poster, the, yeah, the, the billboard, yeah, the four yeah, and twenty yeah, billboard, yeah. where it's like Ben Simmons, former uh, uh, ruck prodigy, yeah, former ruck prodigy. It's like you couldn't have done that more. Yeah, I know. It's going to turn it worse. Especially the actual ad on TV with Ben Simmons makes the three. Like, it comes on air literally at the time. Is that ironic? Had... I've been asking myself that question as well. But it'd have to be because literally, like, you'd have to think they consulted someone with some basketball knowledge. But um, regardless, either way, um, I think that, you know, as we said, just going back on top with Melbourne Victory being back at Amy Park, it's great. Because obviously, you know, they had a tough season. Get back inside the smaller stadium. You have a chance to um, yes, I know you're watching the Ben Simmons ad right now. I think it is. Uh, it's got to be. It ironic. has to be ironic. Yeah, but, it is. Um, uh, having now going back to Amy Park, it's great because you know, I mean, Victory's having had a really tough couple of seasons, and being able to play in a smaller stadium, you know, fans actually prefer going there. It's much easier to get to. Let's just think about that. You know, just in terms of if you decide to drive or decide to, you know, get on a tram mm. or a train, it is a lot easier to get to. M- much. I actually, I actually don't mind. Uh, I actually don't mind the avenue of getting to Marvel. Yeah, but the thing is, it's so much annoying to easier. get home. Annoying to get home because you because I'm on this. This is personal. I'm on the Sandringham line. Yeah, and so you go go to the game. You come back, and it's it's always like I never know what platform it is. Platform twelve. Southern Cross is not easy. Southern Cross. The only good thing about Southern Cross is the intercom. How it's just really high quality. <laughs> Have you noticed that? It noticed? is. Yeah, it is really, really high quality. But I think um, it's just just in terms of a football perspective and a spectacle. You want to have you know, especially with crowds not being at the level of fifty thousand people per game, and Victory mm. don't have the fan base to get fifty thousand a week at the moment because there's just not the interest in them right now because of the way they've been playing. Yeah. It's good just to go back, do similar to what Brisbane Roar did, move out of the big ground, play at the smaller ground. Yeah, it's fine. And Amy Park is just a better, better arena. It's mm. more modern. It's nicer. It's better for fan experience because you're a lot closer to it. Like as well, being in an oval when there's a rectangular, you know, pitch. If they're not moving the seats, even when they move the seats, it looks clunky and awkward Mm. because there's like those weird pockets to the side. It just looks really, looks really crap. Doesn't work for me. So it's nice that uh, they're going to go back to a proper stadium. Ed, time for us to wrap up and uh, say Mm. goodbye for those watching. Before you saw Ed was a. Should I drain one? Drain one. Show. Yep. Just, just. Knock one in now. You might not be able to see it actually on the stream, but just pop it in from distance, mate. And he's missed. Um, if you've missed any of the show, we spoke about our Ligon Street experiences a little bit earlier on and also touched on some of the fan behaviour at Wembley Stadium, um, which we did a big no-no to. Head over to the Spotify platforms or your Apple Podcasts, wherever you might get it, and catch up on that anytime. But uh, for myself, Nick Tobio and Ed Gooden, it's goodbye for now. E- Yeah.